Well, it was way back in 1970 in the Wasika State Theater. And besides being a surveyor for the county, I was also a projectionist. And Rich Ebensteiner, who ran the theater, and I were having a chat after the movie and talking about adventure. And I told my said, Rich, I think I'm going to leave Wasika and I'm going to fly to South America or uh, drive to South America, and, or maybe I'll fly to Australia and drive across Australia. He said, nah, nah, it's been done before. Why, why don't you do something that's never been done? And I said, what well, hasn't been done? And last year we went to the moon. And he laughed and he said, oh, there's a few things that haven't been done. You could walk around the world. And I said, walk around the world? That's ridiculous. There's water. And he laughed at me. He said, well, here's what you would do. You would walk from Wasika, Minnesota to New York City, touch the Atlantic Ocean, fly across the Atlantic Ocean to Portugal, touch the Atlantic Ocean there, and then walk across Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, touch the Indian Ocean, fly to Australia, touch the Indian Ocean, walk across Australia, touch the Pacific Ocean, fly to California, touch the Pacific Ocean, then walk from California back to Minnesota, and what have you done? And I said, by golly, you probably walked around the world. <laughs> and he said, that's right. And I said, I'm going to do it. And about a week later, I told my brother John, who was going to the University of Minnesota, because I knew he wanted to do something different when he graduated. And we were, I still remember walking down the staircase and, uh, at the university and I said, John, I got an idea. Uh, I think we're gonna, we could walk around the world. And he kind of looked at me and he said, that's a great idea. We're going to do it, aren't we, without even thinking about it. <laughs> kind of like I the same thing. And I said, well, one thing we have to do. Back in those days, you didn't say goal setting. But we knew we had to set the date. Otherwise, we'd say someday, someday, someday. So I said, we have to set a date. He said, well, I graduate in, uh, I think it was June 15th or something, in June anyway, and he said, how about we do it a Saturday right after I graduate? So on June 20th, 1970, we walked out of town, just like that, without, without much thinking too much about it, but, uh, you know, not too much planning. Really. But you did write to 500. Yeah, well, you know, when I first got the idea, I read away. I was excited before I even went up to see John for two weeks, so I was doing a lot of things like, writing 500 American companies, <laughs> hoping that they'd sponsor the walk. <laughs> uh, out of the 500, about 100 uh, sent back uh, letters saying, unbelievable, I, I can't believe anybody would be able to do that. Sorry, we can't sponsor you, but cough, uh, Smith Brothers Cough Drops, <laughs> Smith Brothers Cough Drops sent us a box of uh, licorice flavored cough drops and they said, uh, just in case you catch cold, this might help you out. But that's about all we can do. Because they didn't believe us. Nobody believed we were going to do it. Nobody. Because you were just two, two, you know, two guys from, brothers from yeah. a little small town. And Everybody thought we were crazy, there. really. You know, they so, uh, yeah. But then things kind of started happening for us because, you know, uh, newspaper men are always looking for a good story. And a small town, this was a spectacular story for him, really. So Other, who was the uh, president of the newspaper, Wasika News at that time, he got behind it and, you know, oh, I think this is great, wonderful, and let's do some stories and get some stories. Then the people started thinking, well, maybe they might just do it. And then he contacted the Associated Press out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they put out a story. Well, then people thought, wow, this is going pretty big. Then things started happening, like, for instance, uh, a, a guy said, a woman said, how are you guys going to carry all your uh, equipment? This was a lady in Minneapolis. A really nice lady. And we said, well, I suppose we're going to carry a backpack. She said, that is ridiculous. Going to carry a backpack around the world? I think what you guys need is a mule, a horse, or a donkey. You won't just be two guys walking down the road and people will see that you're really walking and it'll add excitement and character to your walk. That was the best idea because all, I'm just skipping over here, all the way across the USA people say, hey, what you guys doing with that mule? You know, cause of attention, attention get to the mule was. And we tell them that they invite us over for dinner or into a restaurant to have a special dinner or bar to have a few drinks or something like that, offer us foods. Man, that mule thing was just a fantastic idea. And we didn't have to carry anything. Everything was on the mule's back. But the, back to Glossika again, the um, uh, reporter who uh, for the AP contacted the columnist for the Minneapolis Tribune, Robert T. Smith. Now, he, everybody read Robert T. Smith. Everybody in Minnesota got the Minneapolis paper. And he did a, in the end, oh, he ended up doing five columns on us over a period of the four years that we walked. But the first column was a picture of John and I, and boy, when he does a story on you, people pay attention. Then they really started. But then all of a sudden, the same lady said, you know what you guys should do? You should uh, go and see uh, Senator Humphrey. 
Actually, my dad mentioned that first, but I told her and she said, I think that would be a great idea and contacted Senator Humphrey's office, former vice president, and he liked this and gave us a letter that I can get in the very beginning. I thought, wow, this is a great letter from a former president, vice president. These are two fine young men from my home uh, state. Please help them out all you can. Actually, I got that on my website. And what that did for us is that, oh, then he also gave us some great information too. He said, now when you guys get to New York City, you have my letter, and also we got a picture with Senator Humphrey shaking her hand or something. He said, you take the picture, you take the letter, you go to every American, uh, every tourist bureau in New York City, all the countries you're going to walk across. Tell them what you're going to do, show them this and ask them for a letter in their language. And then he said, this is even more important, go to every consulate of all the countries you're going to cross and get a letter in their language because we didn't speak any other languages. Well, that was just fantastic. Then the mayor of our city gave us a really good idea. Well, you guys want to get the Guinness Book of World Records, because that was one of the reasons we really wanted to do it. And that, that was our, you know, let's get the Guinness Book of Records, and not for chewing gum or drinking a lot of drinks or something like that, something spectacular. The person said, I think what you guys need to do is carry a parchment or a scroll. You have every mayor of every city or every village around the world stamp and sign that as a documentation of your walk around the world. Well, we wouldn't have gotten against Book of World Records if it wasn't for that. Of course, another detail that did help, I knew the curator at the Minnesota Historical Society, and he wasn't really a good friend, but I knew him, and so he, I contacted him, and he said, we'll keep real good track of it and everything. And then, to make things even one more wonderful for us, he knew the editor of the Guinness Book World Records, the founding editor of the Guinness Book World Records, who now has died, and he said, I'm going to talk to Norris McWhorter, and of course, all in all, what happened then with Norris McWhorter and the curator of the Minnesota Historical Society, that's how I got into Guinness Book of Records, two or three times. And also, that's why the wagon and a lot of paraphernalia from the walk is at the Minnesota Historical Society. There's some at the Wasika Historical Society, there's some at the Caledonia, the town we were born in, the Historical Society. You so might be able to look at that. Mm -hmm. all, all that came about, you know, with just this crazy idea of two guys that really didn't know what they were doing, and it all came together. And so when we walked out of town, uh, you know, with the mule and people were excited and, and <laughs> oh, mailman. <laughs> we asked the mailman in Wasika, now we're going to walk around the world. What do you suggest for us to how many miles to walk per day? And he said, well, I think probably you start out doing 15 miles a day. And then you add to that as you get in better shape. Well, we walked 15 miles a day from Wasika to New York City. Then when we got to Portugal, we started walking 20 miles a day, and then a little on, maybe in Turkey or so, we did 25. Then we got up to 30 in uh, uh, way over in a country like Pakistan, India. And when I walked across uh, Australia, I was doing 35. And when we got it back to the USA, I actually walked 40 miles a day to finish the walk. So I really had him, the mailman was right. We started out doing 15, and we improved, and got stronger, and could walk longer and, and faster. And you wore mailman type shoes. Yeah, we did. Other people got crazy about that because they couldn't understand. The best shoes that we wore at the time were Red Wing uh, work shoes. They were all leather and they were very comfortable, pretty expensive shoes. And we tried all different types of shoes because one thing besides the cough drops, shoe companies at that time, there were lots of shoe companies at that time. They said there's all kinds of shoes, sandals and good shoes and boots. And we tried almost every one of them, but none of them really worked and felt comfortable to us. But these Red Wing type shoes, these work shoes, you know, you can actually buy a, that type of shoe at uh, Sears and what have you. It's a, a black work shoe with a thick sole on it, you know. They were the most comfortable. But still, we would cut a little hole over our, our big toe because that would, the knuckle would kind of get bruised. And then we slid it along the side to give a little bit more air in it, you know. So we made them more comfortable. But those were the kind of shoes. We're all 21 pair of shoes. Oh, you can probably see a picture of his lovely shoes foot on one of his website. But I think you need to talk a little about UNICEF too. Oh yeah, well I was getting to that. But John, okay. Now John came up with the idea. He said, well, this looks like everything's going well for us. Maybe we should do something for somebody else. Because the main idea for him was to do something after college and have an adventure and just do something. And for me, the Guinness Book World Records was pretty high because that was one of my favorite books when I was growing up. And I said, yeah, like what? I said, I don't want to collect any money. He said, no, no, I don't think we want to do that. But maybe we should do something like, maybe we should walk for UNICEF, it's for kids. I said, okay, what do you have in mind? He said, well, let's find out. So I went back, that same lady in Minneapolis gave us the idea for the mule. And she said, I know exactly what to do. We'll contact the UNICEF people here in Minneapolis, 
and talk to them. And the first thing they said, we can't sponsor them. We can't sponsor them. <laughs> but we can endorse them to make us some money. So what they did is they made little postcards that we hand out. And it's a plea, and we tell about our walking around the world. They said, please send a donation to UNICEF. So that's, that's where UNICEF came in. And then, of course, when we got to New York City, the UNICEF people there helped us out making contacts and press and stuff like that because they thought, why not? They could get some money for doing that. Nobody ever really kept track outside of Minnesota. And in Minnesota, I think it was written that they made about $6,000, which wasn't a lot. But the Minnesota people said, well, my brother John was shot and killed in Afghanistan. Then they got a lot of donations because as we were going across the world, we always told people, we are not collecting money, but if you got money you want to give away, send it to the UNICEF for the kids. And not too much came in, they said at the first, but then after John was shot and he got that publicity, uh, quite a bit of money came into the Portuguese and the Spanish, and the, uh, not the Portuguese, but the Spanish, and the, uh, the Portuguese didn't like UNICEF. Yeah, I remember the Dr. Souza, who was a wonderful guy when we first met him, Senator Humphrey's letter got us to meet the Minister of Tourism in Portugal. Now, they're pretty prominent people. And he liked everything about us, our walk, and you crazy Americans are really doing something, we're going to help you out. But Portugal is not really good with, at that time anyway, not really good with the United Nations. So we'll kind of forget about that. We weren't going to argue that thing. So, so he decided he's going to give us a donkey and a cart. Now, we didn't say anything about that because, you know, they're giving it to us, right? But when we got out to Cabo de Roca, and he showed us the donkey in the cart with a little cart, and the cart was filled with cheese and wine and everything. It was just wonderful, except this little donkey was a little donkey. And John said, we'll never make it around the world with that donkey. And I said, I don't think so. And we started out walking. It took us three or four days to walk. It would have taken us a half a day. So when Dr. Souza came out and we got to Portugal, Lisbon, Portugal, we told him, he said, look, that's a wonderful thing. You know, they even had local Portuguese girls walk with us for a little while, dressed in the crystal costumes. That was fantastic. That was a wonderful, great idea. Got a lot of publicity for that, but we can't do it. So he said, I understand. I've been kind of watching you guys. <laughs> I thought you'd be here a few days ago. So he said, well, I'm going to put you up at the Ariana Hotel, free of charge, with meals, and we're going to get you a meal. That took about a week, and they found us a big, huge, 16-hand Portuguese mule came from an army base, and that mule was fantastic. And that brings me to the name of the mule. Back in Wasika, before we started, they had a name the mule contest for our little pony mule that our city of Wasika gave us a pony mule to start out with. But that mule was a mean, ornery, biting, kicking little mule. So when we got to New York City, we were happy to say goodbye to Willie Naked. Because the contest, a nun won the contest with the name Willie Naked, and that became our uh, name for our mule. And then, of course, the Portuguese mule was Willie Naked too. And the Australian mule was Will Willie Naked too. And then yes, Jenny the mule. Jenny the mule. Will she make will it? Will she make it? <laughs> <laughs> they did. They put that on my car because I helped him look part of the way. Will she make it? <laughs> and, then, and I had the perfect name because Jenny's are mules. And know? the Aussie, Aussie men got a big kick out of that. Okay. You know, they call the women Sheilas. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I think this would be a good time to kind of take them through from the very beginning. When you left for Seeker, where did you go? Oh. Take them through the journey. Okay, well, of course, we left uh, Wasika, we walked to New York City, which was about, I guess, around 1,500 miles. And then uh, we got a free flight to Portugal by Pan Am. Pan Am flew us to Portugal. And then, like I said, when we got to Portugal, we, uh, we didn't, boy, we were shocked. We didn't speak Portuguese. We'd never been out of the country in our lives. And so we were just, we, we were shocked. And we said, we better go to the tourist bureau. So we decided to go to the tourist bureau and when Dr. Souza saw Senator Humphrey's letter in our picture shaking hands with him, that just made all the difference in the world. So what he did for us in Portugal was just amazing. He called every village or town, and it wasn't very far across Portugal, about 150 miles, and contacted the head man, and we were greeted when we walked into outside the villages. They walked us into town, put us up for the night, took care of our mule, got publicity. It was just, Portugal was just unbelievable because of Dr. Souza. And then he came out to say goodbye to us in Ever of Portugal near the Spanish border. I'm going to do one more thing for you guys. He said, I'm going to contact the Spanish. And he did it while we were there. He wanted to make sure we knew that he did it. And he called up the Spanish, uh, I don't know who it would be, a major official in Badajoz, Spain. 
And he said, then all these two young Americans walking around the world, and he said, by the way, that time he said United Nations. It was really UNICEF, but he said United Nations. And uh, he said, here's what we've done for him. We did this and this and this. And he said, I hope you guys can help him out too. Well, you know, the Spanish weren't going to really be outdone by the Portuguese, but they didn't do every single village in town. What they did is every time we got to a potador or some major Spanish tourist hotel, they put us up with meals. In between, we stayed in chicken coops. We put up our tent. We, you know, we had kind of, it was kind of a tough walk. But once we got to a powder door, we were living like kings. It was, it was amazing. So we, we made it. Get going. Huh? We get going. Yeah, so we made it across uh, Spain, no problem. We got to France. We had a little bit of a problem. The Americans already told us, they said, now when you get to France, they might look down on you a little bit. You don't speak French. You're going to look like a couple of hippies. You're going to smell like a mule. And by God, it was true. And they treated us pretty haughty. Mm -hmm. But some, some young people would help us out across southern France and some of the cities, you know, college people. And then reporters were good. And we got to the American consulate in Marseille, France, and we were just kind of having a hard time because Spain, Spain and Portugal were so wonderful. And called the American consulate for the first time. I got a wonderful American, Mr. Kittenhoff. And he was a car, uh, charge, no, he was uh, in charge of people like us Americans. He said, what the heck are you doing over at the Spanish tour, the French Tourist Bureau? Come over to the American Council. We know all about you guys. We've been reading about you in the paper. We haven't seen so many wonderful things written about Americans in France since I've been here in France myself. Come on over. So he, we went over there. He put us up at his house. He said, anything you want is yours. So for a week, we were put up by the American Council General, he says. And that was just fantastic. And also, he contacted newspapers, UNICEF. Uh, you know, he took care of us. So uh, France turned out to be very good. Then we got to, to uh, Nice, France, and my brother John said, you know something? We should meet Princess Grace. And I hadn't even thought about that, but my brother was kind of like that, you know. Think of it, if we met Princess Grace, we'd have a picture of her in every newspaper in the United States. And I said, yeah, well, I'd be all right. So how are we going to do that? Well, we asked the American Council General in Nice, France. He said, no, no, I'll do anything for you guys. You even have your mule out there on my green grass destroying my green grass. That's fine, but I can't ask Princess Grace to meet with you. It just wouldn't be proper. I can't do it. But I know um, the minister of uh, Princess Grace, and we go, went over and met him. And he said, I know the person who takes care of Princess Grace, you know, like a maid or something like that, I can't remember for sure. And I think you should be her. So we went and met that nice lady, and she liked us, and she said, I think Princess Grace would love to meet you guys. You're walking for UNICEF, and she's really interested in UNICEF. And that's how we got to meet Princess Grace. I don't know if she knew, I suppose she did, that when we went someplace like that, we always took our mule. So I can still remember walking into Monaco and walking up, the, up where the castle was, and the guards opened the gate, and John and I walked in with our mule willy make it right in the royal courtyard. We waited for just a little bit, and all of a sudden, Princess Grace, looking very beautiful, came out on the balcony, and she looked down, and she smiled, and then she started down the steps, and about halfway down, she stopped, almost laughing, but not really laughing, she said, I have met a lot of people in my life, but I've never met two guys with a mule. <laughs> Does she kick? <laughs> and we said, no, of course, and she came down, and no, she was wonderful. I mean, she, she was a princess. And so then we couldn't get a picture because they wouldn't let the American reporters in to take pictures, but the court reporter took a black and white picture of us, which I have on my website, and we didn't get those until the next day, so it wouldn't be instant news, you know, type of thing. But I sent it back to my friend in Minneapolis who was an AP guy, and he got it out on the AP wire, so that picture did go out quite a bit. UPI and uh, AP and what have you, but it was amazing. Then the other thing happened after that is we walked into uh, Italy, and we're walking through a little village in Italy. It was getting pretty close to dark, and we were thinking about staying near this village somewhere, camping somewhere. And a guy came out of a restaurant, and he read about us in the Italian paper, and he said, uh, Americans, Americans, walking world, walking world, with mula, mula. He said, in my restaurant, Tor Hardo, famous adventure. You must have heard of Tor Hardo. We said, yes, we had heard of Tor Hardo. You must come in and meet him. You must come in and meet him. 
Well, where can we leave our mule? Bring the mule inside. Give the mule inside. <laughs> now, this was really hilarious because that restaurant wasn't huge and the ceiling was a little low and was packed with people. Tor I was sitting on the other end with the people he knew. And we had to take the mule through the chairs and tables and Willie was knocking over. Glasses were being knocked over and the people were jumping up and going, Mula, Mula, Mula. <laughs> we got to Tor Heidel's table and he got up and the, the owner of the restaurant introduced us to him and him to us and what have you. And he liked it. He'd heard about us too. He said, this is fantastic. He said, I think what you guys well, should do is he said, oh, you come up and have breakfast with my family tomorrow morning because I'm kind of busy here and it's a little crowded. And he looked at the manager and he said, you're going to take good care of these guys, aren't you? And the guy said, no, nah, no problem. We'll put them up and take care of their mule. Next morning, the car came down because he lived up above this little village in Italy with his family. And we were driven up to his, where he lived in the mountains. And we had family with his wife and quite a few kids. I can't remember how many he had, about six, I think. And uh, he had to leave for, the reason we had to come up for breakfast, he was leaving for London uh, later on in the morning. So uh, then he gave us a copy, an autographed copy of his raw two. And that was great. I got pictures of that on my website too. I think. Yeah, my son has. Okay, after Italy, <laughs> we walked into, uh, uh, well, right before we walked into uh, Yugoslavia, at the time we were called Yugoslavia, we stopped at Trieste. <laughs> and we wanted the mayor of Trieste to sign our scroll, which all mayors and everybody had. And uh, he had been notified before we met him that we were walking into town with a mula. And a mula, depending on how you pronounce it, just like a mairie, it could be the, the city hall or it could be the water. And uh, he didn't want to meet us uh, because he thought we were walking into town with a prostitute. Because <laughs> in some areas, a mula is yeah, a woman yeah, of bad reputation. Yeah. But in the end, it was straightened out and we met the mayor of Trieste and he signed our, our, uh, our scroll. Then into Yugoslavia. All of a sudden, we got into a country, Yugoslavia, but it was Ljubljana, the Ljubljana area, and people were speaking more English than all the other places we had been on our walk. They spoke English, they loved Americans, they wanted to help us out, and they did, and it was wonderful walking across that area of Ljubljana. Then we got into Bulgaria, communist country at the time, and everything changed. People were afraid to come up to us, and uh, we had a few problems with the authorities, but. Humphrey's letter again with the picture did help us out and also those letters we got from the Bulgarian consulate uh, in New York City and the Tourist Bureau. But uh, Bulgaria was the most uh, in the respect of, we, had, we ate yogurt. Oh, they had the best yogurt I've ever tasted in my life. Came in glass jars. But at the time, and I'm sure it's changed now because it's not a communist country anymore. But at the time, the, the, they had the worst food I ever tasted in my life. It was tasteless food. I don't know what it was. John said the same thing. The yogurt was fantastic. Then well, we got into hot dog or <laughs> <laughs> Then we got into Turkey, Istanbul, Turkey, and uh, with the, we went to the American embassy there because they told us uh, er, other American embassies in other countries. They said, make sure when you get into Turkey, you just go to the American embassy. You have to go to the American embassy or the consulate actually in Istanbul because they're going to know how to help you guys out. Well, it was actually the uh, American consulate people, Americans that worked at the council who put us up and took care of us. But they got us the Turkish press. And by that time, we had heard that walking across Iran and Afghanistan were going to be really tough, especially with just a mule, because a mule would not be able to carry enough food and water. And how were we going to make it? We never had any backup. Nobody was following behind us or anything like that. And it was during the winter. No, no. And uh, not yet. And so uh, the uh, American council up there said, you guys are going to have to have a wagon. Well, we didn't want a wagon, because to us that meant people would think we're riding in the wagon. Mm -hmm. So we got talking to some Americans that worked in the, embassy, the consulate shop, the workshop. They said, don't worry about that. If you get a wagon, we can put a heavy-duty canvas on it and put heavy-duty covers on it. You can tie that down. You're walking during the day. It's all covered. You couldn't possibly get into it. Then at night, you can pull off to the, this is the big thing. At night, you can pull it off to the road, no tent. You could climb up in that wagon and sleep off the ground in a covered wagon. Well, that sounded good to us, so we said, okay, we'll get a wagon. Well, then the Turkish newspaper man from the Korean newspaper, let's find you a wagon. Went downtown yesterday, Turkey, took us downtown. He said, you see any wagon there you like? You know, guys with pots and pads on the wagon and stuff. We saw this one wagon. It ended up being six feet long and four feet wide. And we said, that wagon looks good. And we went to the guy and gave him some Turkish lira. 
And they took off the pots and pans and everything like that. And the wagon was picked up and taken to the American Embassy. And we, of course, hooked it up to the mule. And there we had our wagon, covered wagon. And that's how we ended up with that covered wagon. The Americans put the... Yeah, so the Americans put the special canvas on it. So then we were set. We got to um, uh, Turkey, uh, Iran. And the weather was really good yet. You know, it was real hot in Iran. We walked along the Caspian Sea. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful area, and into uh, uh, Tabriz, and then we went uh, into uh, oh, across Iran, and of course we stayed at the American Embassy in Tehran, Iran, for a while. They had an income contacts for us, and then we thought maybe we could walk across Russia. That didn't work out. We thought we could walk across China. That didn't work out, and so we ended up uh, going into Pakistan. And when we got into Pakistan, of course, the American Embassy and consulates helped us again. Well, if we wouldn't have had that letter from Humphrey, mm -hmm. that's why they did it. You know, we were like VIPs. We had a letter from a former vice president actually stating, please help these guys out. So that made the big difference for us. I don't know if we would have ever made it without having our own personal help back up without, without that letter. And of course, in Afghanistan, they were very concerned about us because of uh, bandits and the... Uh, American Embassy had contacted the governor of Herat, Afghanistan, and they met us at the border of Afghanistan with soldiers, and they protected us as, as we went into Herat, and they also protected us most of the way to Kabul, Afghanistan, and when we got to the American Embassy, they were still thinking, well, you guys got through the worst part of Afghanistan, you shouldn't have a problem, and when we left Kabul, Afghanistan, of course, uh, we were attacked by bandits. The reason it happened was because uh, we were walking for Yusuf, but we weren't collecting money. But in a translation of language, you can see where that could get confused. And who would think you weren't walking to collect money? So this reporter, <coughs> Afghan reporter, printed, we were walking across the world with the wagon and, and uh, collecting money for UNICEF. While the bandits read about that, thought we had money, and so they attacked us that night and started shooting. Uh, John was shot and killed, and I was shot and wounded. And then, uh, I had spent uh, about four or five hours out in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan after I checked John to make sure he was either good or bad, and it turned out he was dead. I was wounded in the chest, and I had to uh, uh, get through that. It was kind of pretty scary. I tried to ride the mule, but I couldn't get up on Willie because ne Willie had never been ridden, and also I had the chest wound, and it was too painful for me to get up. So I got beside the road, and I waited, and it was out in the middle of nowhere, no traffic in Afghanistan. But all of a sudden, I heard these uh, caravans coming. And, I, and then I noticed in the moonlight, it was a bright moonlight. night, they had rifles. Men and women, camels, you know, everything. I thought, I better not make a move here because they might shoot me, you know, because I can't speak the language. So they went by, <coughs> and I thought, maybe that was a mistake. Who's going to find me now? And then another caravan came and started coming. So I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up real slow, put my hands up. And, and say, help, help, please help. I thought maybe you might understand that. Boy, they got Jude. They were pointing their rifles, looking around. They saw John's body, no doubt, in the moonlight, the wagon there. And they kept right on going. And I thought, yeah, well, I can't really blame them. Thank goodness they didn't shoot me. Well, when they got to the next town, Sarobi, they said, and this is the way things go in countries like Afghanistan, looks like 200 bandits had attacked these guys in the pass. And so they sent the Kabul, Afghanistan, to the police and the military. And about dawn, all of a sudden, a jeep and two military trucks showed up. And they looked at me, and they didn't pay much attention. They looked at the body, John, and they drove around the wagon and the body. And then all of a sudden, they stopped, got out with their guns. And the captain came over to me, and he said, uh, your friend is dead. And I said, that's my brother. And I said, I need help. I've been shot. Oh, we'll get your help. So he got me in his jeep, and uh, we headed back. And the thing about this is when we were about halfway to Kabul, we had a stop because on the way there, one of their trucks had rolled over and three or four of their soldiers got killed. They were in a hurry to get out to me to help me. And uh, he had to stop and see if everything was as good as it could be. And then he got back in the truck and he told me that. And they said, well, let's go to Kabul. So we did. And I said, the Americans had told me earlier, he said, if you get hurt or sick, don't go to any Afghan hospitals. Go to the American dispensary. He said, just do it. And so we're heading there. I said, I want to go to the American dispensary. Oh, we'll take care of you. Know, where they drove me right to the Afghan hospital. Mm -hmm. Stopped right in front like that, and I said, "No, I can't. I want to go to the American dispensary." And they wouldn't. They they wouldn't go. And get, went up and got an Afghan doctor, and the doctor came out, spoke English. He said, "Come in. We take good care of you." I said, "You take me to the 
American dispensary <laughs> hospital where I'm going to die in this effing truck. And then the captain said, don't die, don't die, don't die. They drove me to the American dispensary. And I was taken care of by Dr. Meadey. And Dr. Meadey was quite a guy, you know, and he, uh, but you know the worst thing about being shot? It wasn't being shot. When you get shot, it's a numbing, shocking sensation. The pain came afterwards when I was out there a while. Mm -hmm. But I chest filled up with blood. And Dr. Meadey came in the second day I was there, and he said, we're going to have to drain that blood. So what they do is they stick a needle in your back and suck the blood out. Two pints of blood. But of course, that was painful. But after that happened, ah, oh, then I felt you know be much better. So it was a good thing. But I want you to back up just a little bit. How you literally played dead to survive. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, to me, that's, that's just amazing to me. That's that's. It is amazing. I know it's amazing to most people, but you know, I was a hunter. I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I belong to the NRA. I believe in the Second Amendment. Tell I believe in that story. Not in California. It's We're too, too complicated. But <laughs> in Minnesota. Tell that story. And if you're that type of guy, you know, I got my first gun when I was 11 years old. And you hunt Minnesota. and you learn about hunting and stuff. You got that mentality. You, you're, you're more of a type of a survivor. More of a type of a notice what's going on around you and stuff like that. And you just know there are certain things you should do. Well, I... When the band just started running over, I told John, I said, play dead. And then I just laid there. <coughs> Didn't move. And all of a sudden, a hand grabbed my arm like that. Took the wrist velocity off my hand. And took my belt, had a knife on my belt. And pulled me up. I was a pretty good stocky guy because he undid my belt. I let him do it. I just let him pull me. Lifted me right off the ground. And took the knife and what have you. And then let me drop back to the ground. And I just laid there and I didn't make but once. also because of your wound, I think that also fooled them. Well, yeah, I'm sure. Left you for well, that. it wasn't that bright out, you know, but they, they just, they fell for it. They got, let me put it this way. Those people in that area of the world are pretty good shots. And they knew that they hit me. Mm -hmm. They may not have known for sure, but you know what? The reason I wasn't killed is because I was just turning. I was shot first. Because, first off, I'll tell you this. You're not supposed to have a weapon when you're in those countries. Mm -hmm. But in Turkey, and a Turkish colonel gave us a single shot shotgun. Mm -hmm. And he said, you guys keep this in your wagon, not for people. Don't shoot any people, but wolves. Mm -hmm. Because when you get out the eastern mountains of Turkey with the mule, the wolves might pick up the scent, it depends, and you might have to defend yourself from wolves. Never happened, we didn't have to do that. Then when we got into Afghanistan, they put a seal on it. So we couldn't use it unless we broke the seal. But I broke the seal after we got out, you know, in the, out in the middle of nowhere. And so uh, this one police captain told us before we left, he said, now look, you have the single shot shotgun. He said, that's not much, but it is a shotgun. He said, if the bandits come, don't you shoot anybody. You tell them, boro, boro, that means go away. If they don't go away, you hold your shotgun up in the air and you fire a warning shot. And they will go away, don't worry about it. But uh, the problem is, is that these guys had read that we had money. And also, they were bandits. And so they did go, when I fired that warning shot, they walked away. And I even told John, I said, well, looks like the police captain was right. But all they did is go and make a circle around us. And in the bright moonlight, they fired a shot. I, we were just turning to walk back to the wagon. And I was just turning like this, and the bullet hit me right here. I wouldn't have turned, it got me in the heart. So that's probably why they thought I was dead, because he figured he'd killed me for sure. So playing dead just worked for me. So. And then the bandits, they caught something. Huh? They, they caught oh, yeah, they caught, later on, they caught uh, two of the bandits. And uh, this is after we left Kabul again. My brother Pete came to take my brother John's place. And we were on our way out of Afghanistan. And all of a sudden, in the evening, we had just pulled our wagon over. And we had police with us. They weren't going to let it happen again. We had lots of police with us, maybe about 20 motorcycles, a couple Jeeps. And we had finished our meal in the wagon, and all of a sudden there was a crap on the wagon canvas, and they said uh, the uh, head of the, this, prov this province, this uh, state, wants to talk to you guys and have you come for a meal. Oh my goodness, I told John, I said, we're going to have to eat because it's impolite if you don't eat. It was good food. It was rice and lamb and lots of good stuff. I could handle it. And, uh, uh, no. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he told us, he said, we found out about these bandits and that they were after the money that they thought you had because it was a mistake. And we caught them 
and we got back your field glasses, your watch, and I can't remember my knife. I think I got back, but that's they didn't get the scroll though, because they weren't interested in stuff like that. They scattered everything all over. The American uh, embassy sent out a team, and they picked up you know, a big plastic bag. They had all our stuff and everything. We didn't lose our letters. We didn't lose our cameras. They didn't take our cameras for whatever. They were just interested in money. Yeah, they were interested in money. Of course, then Pete came. We started at the exact same spot where the shooting took place because we didn't want to skip anything. And uh, Pete and I walked across the rest of uh, Afghanistan into Pakistan. And then from Pakistan, we went into India. And Pete got uh, some kind of a problem, a stomach problem in India. And he was really getting pretty sick. So he decided to hitchhike one of these Indian trucks and keep doing that until he got back to the American Embassy in New Delhi and they took care of him. Like he had some kind of a, a bug. And then he hitchhiked back and uh, we continued our walk across India and then we had to leave our mule because we couldn't take the mule back to the United States. But a very nice woman at the, uh, at the uh, uh, also we had a dog by the way. Mm -hmm. We picked up the dog in Turkey from a Turkish guy. That dog was, was pretty nice but that dog got killed in Turkey when Turkish sheepdogs attacked our dog because our dog got a little bit too far and too close to the sheep. And they were big dogs and our dog wasn't that big, which is unfortunate. Then Americans gave us our second dog when we were in Turkey. That dog, we left an American lady in, um, in India. And uh, the mule had to stay in India. In fact, they weren't going to let us out of the country. We had a mule on the passport. It took the American consulate and an Indian reporter and a lot of explanation, and finally, the head man of the customs in give it to me, and then we signed it, and then we could get out of the country. That's how crazy some of the laws are. So when we got to Australia, we had to have another mule, and the Australians gave us a mule. Unfortunately, that mule uh, died of colic uh, about halfway between uh, Sydney and Perth. And then, of course, when that mule died, I met Jenny before at a party in, in Perth, fell in love with her. She didn't fall in love with me that fast, but I fell in love with her. And uh, I called her up, but well, we did spend some time together. I called her up and I said, I know you kind of have an adventurous spirit. How would you like to help me out? My mule died and I need somebody to tow the wagon. And she said, I'll do it, but I'm not driving a thousand miles across Australia. So I said, that's no problem. I'll come and get you in your car, and then I'll drive your car. So I got a free ride from Pioneer Bus back to Perth. And uh, Jenny and I drove across the outback of Australia, got to Port Augusta, hooked up our wagon to her little Tirana, and then she drove four miles an hour. That was tough to do with a clutch car, driving four miles an hour. Burnt out two clutches. Got her very upset she, because I had to walk along beside the wagon. If I, she wanted me to go up here. She wanted to go up here on the hillside, and then I'd come walking along. I said, no, because people driving by or reporters come, and I'm, it's not, I'm, you know, I've got to walk with the wagon that says walk around the world. But so you have to back up a little bit because the reason I even became part of the walk was because you died. Because what? You are I said that. Did you say, did the mule died. Yeah, the mule died. Yeah. Yeah. I said couldn't that. find it. Yeah. The mule, so Jenny the mule. Yeah, so I, I thought of her right away. Uh, of course. Particularly when the guy, the Australian uh, guy that I talked to, station man, he said, we, there's some mules in this area of Australia. They're all north. And they'll take weeks to get a new mule. I said, I don't think I need one. <laughs> Can I use your phone? <laughs> well, also the reason you had to do did Australia instead of going... Oh, yeah, well, that's kind of an interesting thing. The original plan was to cross, go across Russia. And we tried the Russian embassy in New York City, and that guy said, all he would keep saying, he said, our borders have been crossed many times, so we have to be very careful. He wouldn't give us any answer at all, the Russian in New York. Then we, with the help of the American embassy, we went to the Russian embassy in Ankara, Turkey. That guy said basically the same thing. He said, you know, our country has been invaded many times, and, and uh, you know, we pushed it this time. We said, look it. You can't give us permission anyway. It has to come from Moscow. The Americans told us to say that. He said, all right, I'll send off a telegram and we'll see what happens. About four days later, the American embassy got a note from the Russian and it, they showed it to us and said, we are denying permission for these two Americans to walk across our country, but 
We would allow them to come into our country and walk certain areas. Well, we couldn't do that. Some mm -hmm. Russians are down there. Because they thought we were spies. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. the Ameri that's what the Americans told us. We were actually briefed by the American embassy, by the military attaché before we went in to talk to the Russian. And then again, we decided, okay, we'll walk across China. When we got to Islamabad, the American embassy there, we told them we want to go. Then they briefed us again. And they told us, they said, look, China is not going to let you walk across their country because in this area of Sankeyan, where you have to walk through first, they have military in there. They don't want the world to know. Also, it's very dangerous with bandits. And also, this is important, it's only open for about four or five weeks during the year because of cold and snow. But go ahead and try it. Well, we went to the Chinese embassy, and these guys were a lot different than the Russians. Uh, the, the second in command, Charge the Affair, came out and he said, Ah, oh, David and Peter, they read about us. The two Americans that want to walk across our country. Our country very big. It'd take you the rest of your life to walk across our country. And John and I were laughing because we said, We already walked all the way from USA to here. But we just went along with it. You know, we sat down, they gave us tea. And over tea, they ended up telling us, they didn't tell us about the soldiers, but they told us about the, the uh, weather and how dangerous it would be, and there were bandits in that area, and they just wouldn't feel right about giving us permission to walk across China. So China was home. So then we thought, now what are we going to do? My goodness, we have to walk through Burma? And the Americans said, you can't walk across Burma, because at that time, I was, it still it might be, but out in, the, out in the jungle. But at that time, very dangerous Burma. So what are we going to do? We went to a party at the American Embassy party, and two Australians came up to us and liked us. They read about our walk, and they said, you know, we heard you guys couldn't go across China or Russia. What about Australia? We had never thought about Australia. Yeah. And we said, Australia, Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, just think of it this way, you guys. Now you're really walking around the world, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. Wow, that sounded good. We'll do it. So I'm sure you'll get permission to walk to Australia, which we did. And so therefore, what happened was we went to Australia. And the Australians, of course, gave us the, our mule. And the Tourist Bureau helped us out there. And the rest is history. Jenny even helped me make it to Sydney, Australia. I got back to California. The Californians gave oh, me tell a... Tell them about Newport Beach. What the part? Mule and Newport oh, yeah. <laughs> the mule in Newport Beach. Yeah. OK. The, the uh, Santa Ana, the city of Santa Ana, gave us the mule. And because at that time, the mayor of Newport Beach was like the Portuguese. At that mayor, at that time, he didn't like United Nations or something. Oh, you just can't remember. So he didn't want to meet me down at Newport Beach Pier. But the mayor of Santa Ana was quite a guy. He got in trouble later, but he got quite a guy. He came down to the pier and he walked with me for a while. So, uh, well, they got the mule from Knott's Berry Farm. It was retired. They didn't give me the mule. But the, the city of Santa Ana got this mule, and it was a mule that was retired from Knott's Berry Farm. So it was an old mule. But the funniest thing about that mule is that mule made it up uh, to uh, the Imperial Highway. I can't remember which way I took down exactly. Oh, yeah, I went down Cannon, Ro Cannon Road, you know, up in that area, up uh, like the Jamboree. I didn't go Jamboree, but anyway, we got to uh, where Santa Ana Canyon Road meets Cannon Road, and uh, there's a Bank of America right there, and I could not get that mule across the intersection. That mule just got stubborn. I tried everything. Traffic was bad up. People were upset. Some people tried to help me, pulled on the mule. One guy said, turn him around, head him the other way, and then turn him around. Tried that. That didn't work. All of a sudden, a police officer drove up. I think it was highway patrol. But anyway, police officer drove up, and he said, what's the problem here? You're causing a traffic problem. I said, I can't get my mule to go. <laughs> well, then he kind of, oh, you're the guy that's walking around the road. I read about you. So then he kind of changed his tune. He's going to help me, right? So he got behind him, and he tried pulling the mule, and the mule wouldn't go. So he said, I'll get that damn mule going. He got in his car. Here's the mule. And he very, 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 very slowly he got up behind the mule. And he got about this close to the mule, and the mule kicked out his headlight. <laughs> he jumped out of his car, and he looked at his headlight. He looked at the mule, and he said, I'm going. And he took off. <laughs> he actually took off. That's why I think it was highway patrol, because he wasn't really a city cop. And then I decided, this is ridiculous. So I took the mule over to the side of the road, and I contacted my brother, and I said, contact the people who gave me the mule, and we're going to just have to, I'm not going to use a mule, I'll just walk the rest of the way without a mule. So they came out, they picked up the mule, and they found a guy not too far from that area that had horses, and he said, I'll be glad to take the mule. And so uh, 
So you walked the rest of the way? I walked the rest of the way alone. From? From uh, Newport, well, from, uh, where was that, Corona or something? I can't remember exactly. No. What states did you walk? Oh, I walked across, uh, oh, i got to remember this now. Uh, Arizona, uh, Utah, uh, Colorado. Um, what's after Colorado? Um, Interstate 70. Uh, Colorado went to uh, oh, Nebraska. Oh, tell them about Colorado. I think that's a neat story. Which one is that? Huh? Well, the tunnel, the Eisenhower Tunnel. Well, you know, my idea was walk every single step of the world, the land mass, walk up and touch the water, then fly across. And you can really say you walked across the world. So I got the Eisenhower Tunnel, no meal known by myself. And they wouldn't, I walked, they, people told me they're not going to let you go walk through that tunnel. I walked up there and they weren't going to let me walk through the tunnel. Highway patrolmen stopped. Knew all about me from Minnesota, had recently moved to Colorado, was a high patrolman there, now he's a high patrolman here. He said, let me see that letter from Senator Humphrey. You knew about that. Let me see that letter from Senator Humphrey and that picture you got. He said, I'll be right back. He drove up to the tunnel, talked to the officials. He came back and he said, they're going to, they're really concerned about carbon monoxide. So what they're going to do is they're going to stop traffic for as long, how long is it going to take you to walk there? I can't remember. I knew then, it was like 10 minutes to walk across there. And uh, I said, I'll walk fast. He said, you better. And he said, they're going to let you walk the walkway, not the, not the, you know, the walk, yeah, walkway there so they can repair stuff. So I walked through the Eisenhower Tunnel. Uh, and he turned up the fan. So. No, yeah, he turned up the fan to clear out the monoxide. So that was, that was pretty <laughs> The first cool. person to walk. Yeah, they, they said, I think, I, I think my son put that little article, the AP said, uh, or something, World Walker was the first person, uh, the first un, uh, unofficial person to walk through the Eisenhower Tunnel. That's through Colorado, then. What was Newport Beach like at this time? So I'm assuming oh, it's your Beach. first visit to yeah. California. Well, it was, you know, we did it right down to the pier. I touched okay. the water down to the pier, had the mule, uh, had gotten some publicity. So, there, of course, it was a nice summer day. It was July. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was quite a few people there. So you couldn't tell people who came or people who were there and then moved over to see what was going on. It was there. right there by the Dory Fleet yeah, area. Yeah, right there, down that area. And uh, Pete was there with me because, uh, you know, and my family was there and all that. So uh, it turned out, turned out it was good. I mean, I didn't have any problem. Mayor Santa Ana walked with me, mm -hmm. and then uh, put the mule up at the Santa Ana Zoo, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure with the Santa Ana Zoo they kept the mule for the night. I stayed at my brother's house <coughs> in Santa Ana. That's why Santa Ana got involved because Pete lived at the time in Santa Ana. But um, then I, and of course, like I said, if you want to get the end to the story, you got to have to go to Facebook, Jerry Hughesby, <laughs> and <laughs> I've got it set up. You know, he was, he was, Jerry was my best friend uh, in uh, Wasika. He died uh, pretty young. Can you tell him how it ended now, the walk? Well, anyway, so I got the KSTP uh, news was down there, and they took a video of me walking into town. So I, got, I have that on the Jerry Hughesby uh, Facebook page, and then when you open it up, it just shows me walking into town, the guys talking, and I go up and I put, step in the concrete that I had, they had a footprint for, I put my foot in there, raise my hat in the air, and I'd walk around, we finished the walk around the world. Thousands of people waited and watched in the streets while others walked along with David, including KSTP reporter Bob Clark. David Kuntz says he has no plans to stay in Wasika. The only thing he's sure about at this point is, he will write a book telling about his walk from Wasika around the world to Wasika. Yes, he was at home at last, and it looked as if the whole town had turned out to welcome him. For David Kuntz, the journey ended as it had begun, with a single step and a dream that could not be denied. But that's the only film I've got actual moving you know, of the walk. I got lots of pictures. Sure. And the way I got pictures, everything was luck about this walk. Because somebody contacted the Chamber of Commerce in Wasika and said, I hear these, and we were, I hear these two young boys that are going to walk around the world are using Kodak Instamatics. That is ridiculous. It was actually the National Camera Company in Minneapolis. They said, we're going to send them two really nice professional cameras. So we kept black and white film in one and, and uh, colored slides in the other. So I mean, I've got wonderful color. If you look at my website, my son has them on there and you can click on them, they open up a little bit. And uh, they're great pictures. So. 
It was luck. Yeah, it was <laughs> that was luck, I mean, really. And if, if John wouldn't have got killed, I would have never met Jenny because we would, it would never have happened that way. At the same time, we wouldn't have been in birth. We wouldn't have had that party that I met her at, you know, because it was a council that said, they're having a party. Uh, this American teacher is in Perth and up in Darlington. They're having a party. And so we got invited to that, and there Jenny was at the party. And at this party, you know, I was co-hosting it with American teacher friends that I had in Perth and busy just taking care of everybody like I always do and making sure everybody had their food. And all these women were just crowded around him, listening to his every word. That was a benefit of going on a great adventure. I was like, what? All the these women, women, women liked it. Just, were just and of course, they love Americans, you know. Oh, and, and so I was busy, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting, what's going on? And I just kept doing my thing. And at the end of the evening, he came over and said, oh, hi, how are you doing? Blah, blah, and blah. And then I followed up, because uh, Pete and I decided to go with you and, uh, who was with Oh, uh, Linda, to your place. And, and then, of course, I can't remember, I guess, you, oh, you gave us a ride back to our hotel, because the was putting us up. And then we kind of said, you know, I told her, I said, I'll, I'll see you. But what I did is I got up early next morning and got a, I think I got a cab, I'm not sure. Got a cab up to Dollar, about 12 miles up to Darlington, up the Darlington Hills. And I climbed up onto, she was living in a wonderful house, but it had these big uh, beams. So I came around the back, I knew where her bedroom was, and I, I climbed up on the beam like that and knocked on the window. Like Romeo. <laughs> Here's Romeo. And I, I, I was just waking up, I'm like, what the heck? What? And wearing pretty sexy jammies too. No, yeah. my. Jeez, I'm like, what the heck? How did you get here? And you know, after that, he never left. <laughs> That's about it. Oh, then he came back to finish that last part from Newport Beach to back to Minnesota. It was like calls. I had like five hundred dollar phone bills every month because he would just call collect home. I didn't have any money. But for some reason, you know, I didn't know when he did leave. Yeah, he might come back, but I was definitely fascinated by the man and the adventure. You know, there was not even a thought of love. I, you know what I mean? It was more the fascination and this adventure, and I'm a part of it, how exciting. But there must have been more to it than that, because I wrote you every night. Mm -hmm. I wrote and you every night. And accepted my phone calls. And accepted your phone calls. <laughs> And what we did was he, uh, the Greyhound bus type of company in Australia would deliver stuff that I would send to him all along the way. They drop off water. That's why we had to have water for the water, mule. Water and so also it yeah, was Pioneer bus actually. Pioneer bus. Owned by Greyhound, but yeah. But also um, at Easter time, I packed Easter eggs and coolers and sent them along the way. <laughs> Crazy, crazy stuff. Care packages. Yes, oh yes. Oh and it didn't take me long to get back. Either three days after the walk, I was on my way back to California. Yeah. Uh, I stopped at my brother Pete's house, and then I planned to Australia and back to Jenny. Wow. And I didn't know you were for sure coming there either. Of course not. Well, I told you I was. But I know, but I mean, you know, men stay stuff. <laughs> but yeah. It was, pretty much. it was quite a bit. It's kind of like, you know, everybody has dreams. But you might say I took action on my dream. Because I wanted to do something. Well, that's another thing, too. With When he came back, he did slide presentations to schools all throughout Orange County, Northern California, Southern California. And the things that I loved him saying to kids is that, set your goal. Believe in who you are. You can do it. I walked around the world. I can do that. I did that. Follow your heart. Do your dreams, you know. And, um, you know, we did get a book out um, quite a few years ago called The Man Who Walked Around the World. It was published by William Morrow. But that was another challenge because, you know, no one wanted to take a chance on an unknown author. So we had a gentleman named Clinton Trowbridge, who was a great writer, writer from... Maine. Maine, who came and met with us and said, this story has to be out. This is crazy. So he came and helped us put this story together because no one, he had written the manuscript. It took him a whole year in Australia to write the manuscript and uh, brought this very thick manuscript, all handwritten um, over the year because that's what he did when I went to work. <laughs> write, write, write. But no one wanted to take a chance. But Clinton Trowbridge came and said, let's put this out. Let's get this book together. 
And so we did get the book out in 1979, <coughs> called The Man Who Walked Around the World. It wasn't quite done the way Dave would have liked to have seen it done, because he wanted to have the story written the way he lived it, because that made sense to him. But, but basically, you know, uh, publishers will say, this is what I want, and you have to give them what they want. So it was done in a very different way, where part of the journey was chronological, and other parts were flashbacks of how it was before or after, and things like that. So it, it was a, a bit of a confusing type of story, but it was good for Dave, because it did give him ownership of a book, and he did get to have his name on there, so that was... And also, if anybody really had put in an hour and 15 minutes to go to my website, <coughs> And my son put my presentation that I did for 20 years on my website. Mm -hmm. The thing about that is, I did that at Jenny's school one time on Saturday. She was working, and nobody was around, and they just have to have the video camera set up in the auditorium. And I thought, wow, I'm going to do my program through the open air. So there's no audience. They don't get that clapping or anything like that. So the uh, visual is not that great, but the sound is very good. And I, that's where I really tell my story from beginning to end for that hour and 15 minutes. And then I'm not sure how many years after the walk, um, well, I basically came thinking we're going to get this book done, and I'm going home in a year or two. 42 years later, I'm still here, married to this lovely man for 42 years, still the same man. Uh, I'm not sure how many years ago uh, that... Um, the people came, the HBO people came and said, we want to make a about 15 movie years ago. about 15 years ago. Actually, it wasn't HBO. You know, it started. I, I told you it was lucky, the walk was lucky. Was well, the book was lucky because the guy calls me up from Maine and he read, he actually saw a picture in Time Magazine because in 1974 I had a picture, a full page in Time Magazine with a picture. Cover. And he said, I saw this picture in this article and why hasn't there been any books? So anyway, that's how the book got started. But then the then another guy called me up from New York and he said, I read your book. Where's the movie? There should be a movie. Well, Jonathan Moss, who now lives in California and has been working on this for 15 years, trying to get a movie, trying to get a movie, finally, after 15 years, about after 10 years, got HBO involved and was just about ready to go into production. And the West Coast, Coast uh, uh, leader of HBO decided, the woman, who was really interested in it, she left HBO. <clears throat> the guy that came in, it wasn't his project, so it dropped. Jonathan Ross wouldn't give up. So he got two other people, uh, Ann Carey and uh, Glenn, a uh, guy named Glenn, and they uh, did up a contract, and they got 18 months now that still... Well, the script is done, which is yeah, very good. The script is done. But it's all, it's all to do with money. You know, it always comes down to that. Who will put the money? And they also feel they've got to wait for the right time. You know, timing is of the essence with movies, you know. And he, it was bad luck for Dave because they had just made a movie about the man who walked across America at that time, remember? I forget his name. And so they were in another walk, another walk story. So timing is of the essence. So they had bought the rights for everything and bought the rights of your life pretty much. And when it's the right time, according to them, hopefully there will be a movie out. No, when out. they get the money. That's when the they get the money. But for <coughs> me and for Dave also, it's icing on the cake. Yeah. You know, if I don't get the book, I'm not going to do it. The movie. I mean, I've got the Minnesota Historical Society, the Wasika Historical Society, they all got stuff. And but I'm also going to be red carpet ready, because you never know. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be red carpet ready, because you never know, because you've got to be... You have to be positive about these things. That's it's, right. Yeah. Jonathan Ross, the guy who's been working on this for 15 years, he keeps telling me all the time, you're going to have to buy a tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> but someday, you know, it, it will be if it's meant to be. So what but, year did you... So we you know, came the main thing to think about there with the book, and the reason I don't get too excited is, because I, I'll give you one example. Sure. I did my presentation to clubs, organizations, women's clubs, men's clubs, uh, rotary, uh, uh, rotary. rotary clubs, schools, mainly schools. But I'd go to a, a club, an adult club, and I'd get there and the, you know, walk in and, I'd, uh, I'd, and through where the people were, and I'd hear guys saying, who, who's, who we got speaking tonight? A guy who walked around the world. What? A walk? 
who the hell wants to hear about a walk? I mean, I really heard a lot of that stuff. But if you watch my, if you listen to my video, but once they heard your story, once your story. I tell the story, all of a sudden I could see the audience going with me, you know, and they pop at things, and I get out and they say, "My God, I thought that was just going to be a walk. That was an adventure, and well told too." So. Well, he is so animated when he does his presentations, you know. I was. And no. to well, now you're, yeah, not as much, but. But I was, I it was like he just it. lived it yesterday, the way mm -hmm. he tells his story. And people just really are there right with him. Uh, and there's so many elements to the story that captures their oh, audience. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's talk about when did we uh, come back to California? In 75 is when I moved to California with Dave. 1975 we came here. To Minnesota. And, to Minnesota, and then we came to, well, let's talk about that. <laughs> that part of the journey was not so fun for me because I came from Australia. It was like so cold in Minnesota and Iowa. I didn't know what the heck I had done, left my family. Uh. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm here in California, and then what year did we actually move to Oh. We lived in a couple of different places. We lived in first in Costa Mesa, and then we lived in Newport Beach on 19th Street at the very end there of Newport Terrace. And when we lived in Newport Terrace, we Dave has a still to this day has a very adventurous spirit. We never go home the same way we went somewhere. Or oh, what's that new road there? Where is that new bridge there? We haven't explored that area over there. So he's still got this adventurous spirit. So one day we ended up on Balboa Island after dinner because we love taking walks. And we walk the island We after dinner every night, drive here. I said, Dave, someday I want to live here. Just one thing I have to say. Yes. Before we went to Balboa Island, we moved to Hawaii for a year. Oh yeah, we did do that. And when we came back from Hawaii, that's why we were looking for a place. And yes. Jenny always wanted to live on the island. I wasn't so keen about that. Because I know, because when we came back from Hawaii, um, he said, I'll find us a lovely place. I love San Clemente. I'll find us a lovely place in San Clemente. Well, lo and behold, he finds us a hotel room at that San, at, uh, right San Clemente Hotel. A Beautiful uh, view out the window. But it was a one room. studio apartment, one room. I'm like, what the heck? I'm living here now? But, you know, all in all, I try to remain calm and stay there for three months because we had to, had to put my clothing in t bins and in the storage bin down the road, go get my clothes for work. I was teaching. But we made it work. I said, Dave, we have to find another place. So. We came down after school every day. We'd drive to Balboa Island and go up and down the streets looking for an apartment, looking, looking. And then we found this little card in um, Colwell Banker, and it said, a two-bedroom apartment on Pearl Avenue. <laughs> and I said, Dave, we're going to go see it right now. He said, I don't feel so good today. Let's go tomorrow. I said, we're going now. <laughs> so I get over there, and this lovely gentleman, um, Ross Miller. Came in the back door. He, I yeah, went to the back door. I went up, and I knocked on the door. I said, I'm interested in the apartment. He goes, you, just you? Oh, no, you and your husband. No, oh, this is too small for two people. It's just, it's very small. It's one bedroom and one den. It's very small. I said, can I see it? And I looked at it. I said, I want it. You know, this. Oh, no, no, you can't. Your husband has to see it first. You can't just sign papers. You know, woman, you know, basically. That was the way Ross Basically. Was. And I said, well, you don't give it to anybody. I'll come back tomorrow with the husband, and we will take care of it. So we moved into 110 and a half uh, Pearl Avenue. And uh, a few days after that, it was an empty apartment, so we had to get furniture. So we slowly got some furniture. And one day, there's this uh, call from downstairs in the at the bottom of the stairways, because it was upstairs. So is anybody up there? Peggy. Peggy Morata. Oh. Came with a big basket, a welcome basket from BIIA. She was on the welcoming committee. Come on up, Peggy. Came on up and welcomed me to the island. And now you're an official Pearl Girl, she says. And from that day on, we just, our friendship just blossomed, and um, I didn't know her as well as till we moved closer, but 
we got to know each other and I'd see her walk with her first dog. This was even before Baby Girl, it was, she had another dog that passed. But she'd be walking the alleys all the time with the dog and we'd stop and visit and talk. And uh, the Pearl Girls, I became initiated to the Pearl Girls. <laughs> Pearl Girls was basically the 100 block of Pearl. And we have all kinds of events that go on uh, throughout the year. Um, I never can keep track of whether it's Labor Day or Memorial Weekend. We had our seawall party. Everybody brings food, and we literally put tablecloths right on the seawall <laughs> and have all our dishes there and um, have that event there. And then the Pearl Girls uh, also had um, the 4th of July, the flag raising. We still do that to this day, but it's such a history because I just became part of the Pearl Girls, but from what I remember, or they told me, and probably Peggy, Mary Hardesty was one of the instrumental people with the Pearl Girl 4th of July flag raising, because they, way back when, she was like the Pied Piper, and all the children would decorate their bicycles 4th of July, and she would have her trombone, and the kids would parade in their bicycles all around Pearl Avenue on 4th of July. It was so much, must have been, I saw pictures, but I never did get to experience that because I came much later. But So that tradition, we just love, Pearl people are just love tradition and we continue these, to, you know, and to this day we still have our Pearl Girl, we have our Christmas party. Um, now we are having it, we've tried many places, but now we're at the uh, Newport Landing at the Newport Landing, up in that little room up there. It's so nice. There's about 15, 15 of us, 15, maybe 18, if everybody can make it. So we have our, you know, gatherings that we have our pearls, and the Pearl Girls wear their pearls for Christmas, um, and get dressed up and have a great time. And then you became involved with the museum. And then <laughs> Peggy, Peggy, <laughs> oh Jenny, you would love the museum. <laughs> We need you at the museum. Okay, baby. So I became involved with the museum. And I do love the museum, and I, and I love history. I really enjoy history. And I didn't know, I mean, when I first came in here, I didn't know it was, it was a man-made island. And I tell that to people these days who are even like more surprised than I was. You know, and they're going, what, what? And so I really enjoy telling the history of the island, and now I've taken over, and it's even more significant for me now that I'm in Peggy's spot. Mm -hmm. It's so meaningful for me. I feel like her spirit is in me when I'm here and, and share all the stories. Because I learned a lot from Peggy. She, because I would come with her many times and just be here with her when she was telling the stories, and those stories that I've incorporated into my stories because she knows so much. She was such a civic-minded lady who loved her island, loved her people, loved telling the stories of, you know, her, her time here. So, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And then we have to mention Jeff Herdman. Was your superintendent? Yes, he is so my, my principal. My <laughs> principal. <laughs> Jeff was my principal in Irvine, because I taught with the Irvine Unified School District for 35 years. And he was a principal with me for 10 years, I believe. Yeah, when we, we were just leaving our old school, moving to the new school, um, because our old school was just falling apart. And um, we left our old school at El Camino Real, uh, close to Irvine High School it is, on um, Jeffrey and Culver, somewhere, Culver, Culver and Karen Ann Lane, up in there, by the, uh, by the fire station on um, Culver, and uh, he was my principal there for 10 years, and then he retired, and then we moved over to our new school, which I go volunteer at now, called Woodbury School, and I volunteer there. So I've been with the Irvine Unified School District for quite some time. I've been very blessed to be in a career that I just love so passionately, teaching. It was in my soul from a child. I used to. I'm one of seven children, and I used to have my brothers and sisters be my students. I would play teachers as a child, and so I just knew that was always in me to be a teacher. And yeah, he was my principal, and I planned his retirement party because I was social committee all the time, the Miss Social. 
And I love the island because I love like being an ambassador for the island and I tell everybody I'm the greeter. I just made myself the greeter of Balboa Island. Because <laughs> on all my walks, I walk every day and on all my walks I just hi to people. Oh, I hang out by the ferry there and, and I play tour guide or ask people ask me where to go, what to do, and where am I? <laughs> this last lady just cracked me up though. I met her in sunny days walking home from church and she said, now I want to go to the island. I said, you are on the island. <laughs> You're right now. You are What? I'm on the island. Yes, you are right on the island. You came on the bridge, right? Yes, and you're on the island. So what can I do now? <laughs> so I said, well, there are lots of things you can do here. So I told her about the ferry and the beach. And the Any bit of Hollywood? Um, well, I'd like to someday, you know, have this movie be <laughs> out and walk the red carpet sure. in Hollywood. That would be awesome. <laughs> For the time being, how about any Hollywood star sightings for you two while no, living here? Not really. Let's see. Well, Buddy Epson okay. is my only uh, sighting right on the island because I uh, met him at Martha's bookstore one day. I heard he was going to be there signing his book. So I went and bought his book and had a few moments with him. And I like, what? It's Buddy Epson. I've watched all those Beverly Hill, Billy, you know, TV series. and. Here I get to meet him. He was so awesome and so tall. For some reason, he just stood out to me as very tall. But, yeah. So that's about the um, only. Mm -hmm. I think. Do we know any other movie stars? And well, you met, you know, a couple of big people in the, on your walk with Princess Grace and Thor Heyerdahl. Now he's like my star. Right. <laughs> the quiet star. The quiet. <laughs> The Kermit crowd. I'm the loner with a partner. And she's a social miracle. <laughs> so you want to fly. Sometimes I, but I, I, I stay love, away from her because I love people. it's way too much. I love people. I love being with people. I get energized by people. That's what I love about You know, I grew up in a small town. I was born in a very small town. Grew up in a small town. And I was tired of small towns because Everybody knows what you're doing. They knew when you came out the door, you knew when you were downtown. I said to myself, when it, John, when I went on the walk, I said, Dad said, no more small towns for me. I don't want people knowing what I'm doing. I can be pretty darn good. So this Not, is a rare sighting of Dave, Dave, you know, here. Very rare. I stay away from people. <laughs> we do walk at night after dinner. We usually walking around 7 o'clock at night, but he only comes out. <laughs> or early hours of the morning. You walk well, you know, if you walk church. with Jenny, everybody she sees, she's got to stop and talk to. Them. Yeah, That's I not me that. at all. You know, it's not me at all. So it's better for just let her do her thing. She lets me do happy. my thing. That's why we're together for forty some years. Yeah. She does her thing. I do my thing. Yes. yes. <laughs> and now he's even let me into his kitchen, which is lovely. <laughs> Because that one, when he moved in, he goes, it's my kitchen, I do everything in here. Fine, I don't know, I'm not going to complain. But lately he let me into his kitchen to do salads. Now I even get to make meals. Oh, yeah, you make much for meals. <laughs> I'm happy to give it up. Any other lasting memories you'd like to share about the island and your experiences? Well, I hope I never leave this place. I love this island so much. I love the freedom of it. I love that I can walk everywhere. And there's just really a wonderful feeling about being here and the people that live, especially on Pearl. You know, we all watch out for each other and uh, take care of each other on Pearl Avenue. And I love my church. I. Um, very involved with my church here. Um, and then I'm involved, since my retirement, about five years ago now, with teaching, I'm involved with um, ML Cancer Survivors, so I'm involved with the um, Discovery Shop, Cancer Society Discovery Shop in Crown Del Mar. I volunteer there. And I love gardening, and I don't get to do much gardening on Pearl Avenue because we're in just little pots, few. And so I garden at Sherman Gardens mm -hmm. and volunteer there. And then my school, because I miss the children, I try to do one day a week there. And then, of course, this lovely museum, which I'm now it's like my, like you said, I'm back from my hiatus. 
Jennifer. <laughs> she, that's what she called it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, and I'm enjoying it here so much. Mm -hmm. I love telling about our my home for mm -hmm. for. I said now I need to win the lottery and buy Peggy's house. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. It's such a lovely place, you know. It's such a lovely home. It's such a nice vibe to it, and it's right there. I've continued to feed her birds. Yeah, I feed her birds. Yeah. I don't know. It's just this is where you know. Once I decided this is going to be our home, I don't want to ever leave. <laughs>